Hey, greetings everyone. Welcome to tonight's uh, webinar, most important healing secret I ever learned. I um, This is a message that I, I wish I could get out to the whole world. This is a message that I wish I could, could uh, reach millions of people with because it's such an important concept and it's so little understood. Uh, it's really not understood at all in the terms of of orthodox medicine and even in the terms of alternative medicine, I think there are very few alternative healers who understand the concept that I wanna to present tonight. Um, and it has to do with understanding a very simple concept. Whoops, wait a second, my slide presentation didn't advance. Here we go. Uh, and that is that symptoms are good, okay? Because years ago, I remember when I started dabbling in herbal medicine and alternative healing, I was I was trying different herbal remedies and so forth, but I was really um, thinking very allopathically. I was I was expecting herbs and alternative medicine to do the same things that drugs are supposed to do. In other words, I was thinking that you would use golden seal or echinacea in place of an antibiotic to kill the microbes. I was thinking that you would use, you know, some um, herbal remedies like wild cherry bark and white pine and so forth uh, as cough medicines to stop the coughing or, or something to dry up the runny nose or uh, something to arrest the diarrhea or something to take away the pain. Um, I, I didn't understand what natural healing was all about. And it was when I suddenly had this blinding realization of what symptoms were, that everything began to change for me because I started to understand what it was I was trying to do. I understood that I was trying to do allopathy, allopathic medicine, which is allopathy means against the pathology, or which is basically treating the symptom, um, with natural remedies. And natural remedies are not really good at treating symptoms. Um, drugs are far better at treating symptoms than natural remedies are because the real purpose of natural remedies is to actually remove the cause, the thing that's causing the symptom. So what I've learned, I mean, the first thing I learned and I'm gonna to explain tonight was on acute disease, but over the years I've learned basically there are four things symptoms are doing, okay? Um, First, the first one is they're communicating to us that we lack something necessary for the health of our body. Or the second one is that we are doing something that is harmful to our body. Those are, those are the flip sides of the same coin. In other words, the symptoms are trying to tell us that our behavior is either not supporting our health um, or is actually injuring or harming our health. The other class of symptoms is either the body actually trying to heal itself trying to expel something that's irritating and or otherwise um, evoke something to restore itself back to balance, or it's attempting to compensate for a problem that it's having due to either uh, coming back to the first thing, a lack of something necessary for health or something we're doing that's harmful to health. In other words, if we're persistently um, not getting the nutrition we need or we're persistently doing something that's harming our bodies, then the body will develop coping mechanisms, ways of, of coping with what we're trying to do, which basically is trying to survive without those things that it needs. And that's really all that symptoms are. And so what I, we need to do is start reframing our idea of symptoms. Um, any medication that alters your symptoms without actually fixing the cause of the symptoms is really analogous to trying to fix something wrong with your car by uh, disconnecting the indicator lights that tell you that something's wrong. So if you're not going to solve the problem of your car is running low on gas by disconnecting the gas meter. You're not going to solve a problem with your engine overheating by disconnecting the temperature regulator. You're, you're, none of this does anything. And, and since symptoms are primarily the way the body has of communicating with us that something's wrong and needs to be fixed, 
the, the actually attacking the symptom is really analogous to disconnecting those warning indicator lights. And therefore, we have to really rethink our whole approach to how we, we deal with health. And I'm going to get really specific. So let's start with the idea that your body is communicating it needs something. Your body doesn't like talk to you in words. Your body talks to you in sensations. Your body gives you sensations that tell tell you what it needs. And we're all familiar with these sensations. We get thirsty when we need water. We get hungry when we need food. We get tired when we need rest. We get antsy or irritable or, or, or restless when we need to get up and start moving around. Our body is like constantly talking to us and saying, I need this or I need that. And pain is one of the ways the body talks to us. If, if we uh, are handling knives and we cut ourselves, the, the, the cut says, you be careful with that knife. If, if we're dealing with things that are hot and we burn ourselves, it says, be careful around hot things. Pain tells us that, hey, what we just did injured our body. And um, the sense of satisfaction does the opposite. The sense of satisfaction says, well, what we just did was good for our body. In other words, you get this, oh, that feels good, okay? And that, and these are all ways our body has of talking to us. And the problem is, is that society, um, beginning a lot of times in our families with our parents and, and then going into the whole educational system and all, a lot of other things, convinces us that there that we don't know what's best for us that we that we uh have to override these incl inclinations for our body and do something different i mean when here's just a simple thing okay I, my observation is that all children will eat until they're not hungry anymore in other words um, they'll eat just enough to take off the sensation of appetite, and then they want to go out and do things. But you know, parents tend to train their kids, you know, sit and finish eating. In other words, override your body's appetite signals and eat according to what I put on your plate, all right? Uh, because we don't want you to waste food. Um, and, and, and the same thing, even with mechanisms like our body tells us when it needs to eliminate. And we learn to to maybe suppress or ignore some of those signals. I don't know. A lot of things happen that teach us to not pay attention to our body, that we that our body doesn't know better than our head or our brain or our cultural conditioning. And so we start to not listen to the signals our body is telling us. And this is really unfortunate because then we are disconnected and disempowered from being able to take care of our own health because we no longer trust our own instincts as to what is good for our body. And we need to get back to listening to our body and what it's trying to tell us. And the reason why this is the case is because health is found in the balance of things. In other words, you need rest and sleep, but you also need exercise and activity. And somewhere you have to have a balance of those things. You, you work too hard, and and don't get enough sleep or rest, you're going to get sick. You you sleep too long and are lazy and sit around all day and don't do anything, and you're going to get sick. You're you have to nourish the body. You need food, but you eat too much food, then you get overweight. You develop health problems. Um, you have to eliminate the waste of food too. There's a balance between taking stuff in and getting rid of stuff. And sometimes the body. Um, uh, loses the appetite simply because the eliminative systems of the body are clogged and overloaded. There's a backlog of waste material and the body says, don't give me any more food because I can't handle the waste load I've already got. Wait until I get caught up on elimination. Um, but in fact, th this is another thing. Most uh, animals and most children have the instinct when they're sick to not want to eat. But then you have this attitude, oh, you've got to eat to keep up your strength. Eat, eat, eat. Don't don't listen to your body. That's not good. Eat. Okay. This is this is the kind of thing that's been going on with us since, you know, we were very small. We have to keep our body temperature regulated. We get too hot, too cold. We have a problem. Our body has sensations for that. We feel chilled. We feel overheated, and we're motivated to go seek out something to help balance out our temperature. Um, you the the point being is okay. You you can't go and read a book. Okay, it, it, there's whole um, uh, books out there that outline diets, and they tell you to eat um, 
half a cup of this and a cup of that and or so many ounces of of this or that or the other and they're all trying to 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 teach you how to balance out your health and your nutrition using your brain okay rather than using your body it, rather than using your instincts that they tell you this is good for you or that's not good for you or blah 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 and everything and everybody goes up into their head because we've been trained to ignore the body and tries to follow all these things okay trying to get themselves healthy but you can't balance the fine-tuned mechanisms of the body using some formula in a book the only way you can do that is by starting to pay attention to your body to pay attention to when okay you're eating and you've eaten a certain amount of food and your body goes huh that's enough okay and 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 stop letting your brain override that and say oh it looks so good let's eat more because when you eat more you don't feel good all right so and if you're trying to lose weight and you're starving yourself then your body says i need food i need food i need food and it overrides that and you go back to eating too much you have to learn to pay attention to your body this is why it's so important to understand that symptoms are messages they're trying to tell you something and you need to listen to them and pay attention not to try to make them go away um so let me explain a little and, and uh, the problem with drugs and allopathy in general okay it's not that it's necessarily 100% bad. It's just that it is treating an effect, not treating a cause. And caffeine is the perfect example of this. Most people think that they drink caffeine for energy. But energy is a product of um, your body being able to combust fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, primarily uh, proteins and carbohydrates, in the mitochondria of your cells. Okay, and that requires nutrients, vitamins and minerals and so forth that, that build up energy in the form of ATP inside the cells. Now, um, when your ATP is depleted and your body needs to rest, and rest is the way your body replenishes its energy because you stop putting out energy doing things and you slow down while your body rebuilds a nice charge of energy, to carry your activities for the next day. So your body, when it recognizes that it's tired and it needs rest, has, a, has mechanisms for signaling you that you're tired. And one of these is a molecule called adenosine in the brain that attaches to these receptors in your brain and says, I'm tired, I need to rest. I need to maybe sleep or at least take a break or something like that. So what caffeine does, is caffeine is a substance that mimics adenosine, except that instead of telling us we need to rest, it blocks the adenosine receptors and makes us not get the message that we're tired. So in other words, it does exactly what I was explaining about the warning indicator light on your car. It basically blocks the signal telling you that you're tired, which makes you think that you have energy that you do not have. And therefore you keep going. And because you keep going, your adrenaline, your cortisol kicks in gear to try to burn protein from your muscles and your tissues to try to keep you going, okay? And, and, and therefore you, your adrenals start to get tired and you, and you feel more stressed. And the ultimate effect is that you actually are getting more tired, but you don't realize it, okay? You're just blocking the signal. Well, the body has a way of dealing with this. It says, okay, you're going to block the signal that I'm, t that I'm tired. I'm going to build more adenosine receptors so I can get the message through. And that's exactly what it does. So about two weeks after you start using caffeine, the effect starts wearing off because your body now builds enough adenosine receptors for the caffeine to bind to and enough to tell you that you're tired. All right. And so, of course, one of the things people do is then they do more. They take more caffeine, okay? Um, 
or they find that they are now addicted to caffeine. And the addiction comes from the fact that now that I have more adenosine receptors that I need, if I don't take the caffeine, then I've got all these adenosine receptors and all of a sudden now I'm drowsy and I'm tired and I have these other effects because now I'm over getting the message that I'm tired. And I go through withdrawal, which again takes about 10 days, two weeks for everything to adjust back to normal. So is it horrible to drink a cup of coffee a day or have a little bit of caffeine? Probably not. Your body adapts to it, okay? But it doesn't really help fix the problem. The only thing that will fix the problem is sleep. As W.C. Field says, the best cure for insomnia is sleep. So you can't fix what, what, what you can't fix the body when it's asking for something by giving it something else. So for example, I, I sat down with a, a client that, that someone brought in their elderly um, parent, might have been the grand, I don't know if it's a grandparent or, or, or parent, from a, a local nursing home for me to do with. I looked at the lady's tongue, I looked at her pulse, I looked at her symptoms and everything. It was very clear that she was severely dehydrated, that her her everything in her body was suffering from a lack of moisture the lady only drank two cups of tea a day tea tea which actually has a diuretic effect okay which doesn't really hydrate you she hated water okay she didn't want to drink water and i'm saying well what you need to do is drink water because water will fix your problems because your problem is you're dehydrated well she didn't want to drink water is there something I can take, some pill I can take to make the effects of being dehydrated go away? Yeah, the pill is called water. All right, it, <laughs> and it went away. And, and, and you know, I, I could have sold some kind of herbs or whatever to try to um, ease her pain or do, do something to kind of mask the symptoms, but I didn't want to. Why should I? If you're deficient in a nutrient like magnesium or zinc or copper or whatever, there's nothing that you can give the body except what it's deficient in to fix it. If you're tired, the only way to cure that is to rest. If you're you know, restless and cranky and whatever because you're sitting too much, the, the only cure for that is to get up and move. The only cure is to give the body what it needs. That's the only cure okay, for anything is to give the body what it's asking for. But if you're out of touch with your body and you've been trained to ignore your body and you've been trained to listen to the expert advice and you don't want to, you won't do this. And some people just won't do it even when you try to point out to them, this is what they, what they what's going on. Now, the reason why people don't want to take, take water when they're de dehydrated is because there are so many toxins in their body that when they drink the water, they taste the toxicity of their own body. So maybe you can flavor the water a little bit with some lemon and maple syrup or something like that to help them get over the taste of drinking the water, but you've got to get the water into them to dilute the toxins, to flush things out and whatever, okay? Um, or maybe they don't want to drink water because they don't want to pee, all right? But the, the reason why they, they pee so much when they drink water is because the, body, the body's going, oh, there's water, I can flush out toxins, yay, 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 okay? And that'll go away after a little while once you get better hydrated. Now, just as the body tells us, you know, I need something, give it to me. The body also says, don't do that again. Don't do that to me, okay? And, and this is really obvious when we injure ourselves, you know? We aren't looking where we're going. We stub our toe, we grab a hot pan and we burn ourselves. We, we, um, we cut ourselves, you know, with a knife or whatever. And the pain is saying, don't do that. Be careful. Watch what you're doing. Don't don't injure me. Okay. And and, and most of us get that. Uh, oddly enough, here's the thing: if if parents, okay, add on top of the basic lesson that the kid hurt themselves, a big lecture and a big ya 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 ya, and lay a bunch of guilt trip on the kid for make for making a mistake that actually becomes counterproductive because the child learns to listen to the head stuff of their parent more than to listen to their own experience. And they're going to be more prone to injure themselves. The best thing to do is just, okay, oh, it hurts. Okay. Okay. Let me help you with that. 
you know, to be careful next time. That's it. We're, we're so obsessed with this that we can't just let people understand by their own experience, which people are intelligent enough to do, including children, what's helping them. But, but what that extends into is this. We eat something and our stomach is upset and we think it's the fault of our stomach, not what we ate. Or, or we eat or do certain things, we start to get a headache or we start to get aches and pains. And we think, oh, it's something wrong with my body, not something wrong with what I just did to my body. You get the, the problem? Because we think somehow, and again, because it's a cultural conditioning, the way we're trained, that somehow the body just likes to hurt us for no good reason. It likes to make us pain. And the only reason why it is, is because that, that, those, that, that thing happened to us is because the body's just being mean to us, okay? It's not letting us do what we want to do. Um, in fact, some of the earliest symptoms that tell you you're doing stuff that's not good for you are actually not physical at all. They're mental. Your brain fogs up. You can't think clearly. You feel moody in some ways. You're irritable. You feel mildly depressed or or whatever, all of that just saying, because the brain is the most sensitive um, organ in your body. It's very sensitive to nutritional deficiencies, to dehydration, to a whole host of factors. And it communicates that by giving you feelings again, sensations that say, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing to me? Okay, stop that. But we disconnect it because why? Because I get a headache. Oh, I'll just take a painkiller and kill the headache right? I'll kill the message. I'll stop the what my body is trying to tell me. You know, one of the biggest causes of headaches is uh, lack of water. A lot of people who are getting headaches are dehydrated. You start drinking more water and the headaches go away. A lot, a lot of other headaches are caused by magnesium deficiency that's causing muscle spasms. Take magnesium, headaches go away. If you fix what the body is is you know is wrong, the problem goes away. But if you don't, you 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 just mask it, you cover it up with a drug, then you never get the lesson. Understand? You never make the connection. What am I doing that my body is complaining about? Do you follow? That's that's the key. Now. Actually, that wasn't the first thing I learned because uh, that's, you know, that evolved as I, as I went from the, f the first thing I learned about symptoms, which that was that symptoms of acute disease are actually the efforts of the body to heal itself. They're created by the immune system. In other words, nausea and vomiting is a disease. Diarrhea is a disease. Sinus strain is a disease. Coughing isn't a disease. Skin eruptions like rashes are not a disease. Sweating is not a disease. None of these things are diseases. These are actually healing mechanisms of your immune system. And that when I made that discovery, it changed my world completely because I had had chronic sinus problems. I had chronic respiratory weakness. And everything that had been done to that time is like trying to stop that, you know, take antibiotics because I must have an infection got worse. Take antihistamines. Yeah, it dried up the sinuses and constipated me and made me feel worse. Okay. Everything was done to try to alleviate symptoms. Nothing was done to make get the idea that my body was trying to get rid of something. Something I was doing was causing irritation to my body and my body was trying to flush it out as a defensive mechanism. And this idea came when I read this statement from an herbalist named Samuel Thompson who lived in the early 1800s. He says, I ha have found by experience that the learned doctors are wrong in considering fever a disease or an enemy. The fever is a friend and cold the enemy. This I found by their practice in my family until they had five times given them over to die. Now, Samuel Thompson basically said that living bodies are warm and dead bodies are cold. So heat, has to be generated from the life process, not from a disease process. That, that a diminution of heat or a diminution of the energy of the body was disease. And that heat or fever or inflammation was actually a defensive mechanism of the body fighting disease. 
So instead of doing what the doctors of his day were doing, which was trying to bring down the fever by sticking people in cold baths or by giving them compounds like calomel, which is mercury oxide, which suppresses your immune system, which definitely brings down the fever um, or, or whatever, he gave people cayenne pepper and lobelia and got them to sweat. In other words, he, he, and he, he actually put them in a sweat bath and got them to sweat and he got rid of the fevers by actually helping the body get warmer. Now, it, it was quite a few years before I understood the mechanism that, that explains why Thompson was right. When you get a viral infection, the body needs time to build up antibodies to fight the virus and the virally infected cells. So what it does is it elevates the temperature and the elevated temperature inhibits viral re replication, which actually slows the spread of the virus while your immune system gets a chance to get the upper hand and kick out the disease. You bring down the fever, you actually give the virus a greater chance to spread through your system, making it harder and longer for your immune system to attack it and get rid of it. A low grade fever of 101, 102 is actually not dangerous at all. Now, if the body gets too, too hot, like 105, you do need to cool it down a bit. But traditional medicine, herbalism didn't co focus on cooling down the fever. It focused on helping it stimulate the circulation to bring, bring out a sweating about, which is part of what the fever is pushing towards is sweating, which pushes the toxins out of the body and restores the, the natural... Um, balance of the system. So I, I, I think it's, I, I have the hardest time explaining this because I see a parent, and they've got a kid that's got a fever of 101 and they want to give them aspirin or Tylenol or some of the medication because they're alarmed because they have a fever and the fever is bad and this is a horrible thing and I got to bring it down. And again, it's this whole mentality. The symptom is the problem. The symptom is not the problem. That's not the problem. <laughs> the problem is there is a virus in the system and the immune system is raising a fever to fight it. And what you're doing and bring down the fever is you're fighting your own immune system. You're literally fighting your own immune system, trying to prevent your immune system from doing what it's supposed to do. And when I really, like I said, when I realized this was like a blinding revelation, it was like, whoa, whoa. And when I first did it, I was like, oh, okay. It was scary because everything in my social conditioning told me to be afraid of symptoms. The symptoms were something scary. The symptoms were something bad. The symptoms were something to be fought and suppressed. And I had to go and, and trust my own instincts and say, okay, the symptom is the body fighting the disease. How can I support the symptom? How can I help the body do what it's trying to do and flushing out what's irritating the system and bothering it instead of putting it down? And it was scary. But what happened is, is when I started thinking in those terms and acting in those terms, I found that I could very rapidly get over acute illnesses. In fact, I, I, as I got better of it, I often, when my kids were starting to show signs of, of illness, I'd have them better in two hours. Two hours. Two hours. I'm, I'm serious. Even less than two hours. In fact, I used to get colds and get sick and it would linger on forever. I, when I started working against the colds using this kind of philosophy, I found that normally I'd be well in 24 hours. And I was blown away because what I was doing was supporting what my body was trying to do instead of fighting what my body was trying to do. Now, a really good analogy to help you understand this, because, because what I reasoned when I read that thing of Thompson about fevers is I reasoned that dead bodies don't get runny noses, dead bodies don't get diarrhea, dead bodies don't throw up, dead bodies don't do, have rashes, dead bodies just decompose. Therefore, all symptoms of acute illness must be the efforts of the body to heal itself and not be bad. And, that, and, I, and I went about approaching acute illness from that standpoint. And one of the things that I... I thought about that really helped me feel comfortable with this whole approach was thinking about food poisoning. If I go out to a restaurant and they aren't practicing good sanitation procedures and I get some tainted food and I eat it, all right, then when I get back home, I start to feel sick to my stomach. I start to feel nauseous. I start to feel queasy, all right? 
and the symptoms start increasing and they get worse and worse and worse and and until i find myself yeah uh, like i say kneeling before the throne in front of the toilet or whatever and and it, i throw up and when you throw up what happens you feel better you you immediately feel better why because your body just used the mechanism of nausea and vomiting to eject the toxic stuff that you ate and get it out of your system. I may follow that up with a little diarrhea too, but the whole idea is it's, it's flushing out the bad stuff. So if you could take a drug that would make the nausea go away and suppress the vomiting reflex, would that help you recover from food poisoning? The answer is no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't help you at all. It would make the whole situation worse. And once you get that idea, then think about the fact drying up the runny nose or trying to suppress the cough or trying to make the rash be suppressed with something you put topically on the skin to try to, to stop the rash is always counterproductive. It is always working against the body, not with the body. And therefore, ultimately, is going to make you worse, not better. And um, so out of this, I, I coined the phrase, the cold is the cure. The reason why modern medicine won't ever discover a cure for the common cold is because what we think of as the cold, the runny nose, the fever, the, the sore throat, the, the sinus drainage, the coughing, the blah, 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 all of that is a healing process. It's not a disease process at all. It's a healing process. It's a healing process. I'm going to repeat that. The cold is a healing process. It is a cure. It is not a disease. It is a cure for a disease. In fact, th this, this was driven home to me um, even more powerfully when I read this thing in a book called The Scent in Medicine. Uh, uh, I think it was Nine Doctors Speak Out. And one of these doctors was talking about what happens when you get the um, chicken pox. I, mean, I don't remember if it was chicken pox or measles, but one of those diseases. I think it was chicken pox. And he was saying that when you're exposed to the chicken pox virus, it incubates in your body for two weeks. Two weeks. You have chicken pox for two weeks. And then suddenly you get a fever your skin breaks out in pox and all these symptoms occur. And the symptoms occur because the immune system has recognized the presence of this virus and is now mounted an attack to kick it out of the system and get rid of virally infected cells. Meaning that the entire thing we call chicken pox is a healing process. And we now know that if you, if you, take aspirin or other things to suppress the fever and suppress the chicken pox. The body may not get the chicken pox virus out of your system. And now you have a low grade case of chicken pox, which when your immune system gets weak, flares up with something called shingles, which is still chicken pox, but it now it's chronic chicken pox instead of acute chicken pox. And I would propose to you that this is what we are doing in general with disease. In fact, um, there's even some evidence that a lot of cases of shingles are caused by the chickenpox vaccine because the chickenpox vaccine not going through the normal channels of going into the body confuses the immune system. You've got a low grade case of chickenpox that can now flare up as shingles. So all I'm saying is we need to rethink what we're doing. We need to rethink our approach to symptoms because our entire medical system is geared towards relieving symptoms. Working against the, the symptoms is the hallmark of allopathic medicine. So I learned that this was true. From, uh, and then I, I found this book called Food is Your Best Medicine by Henry Beeler. And he quotes this um, uh, uh, a natural healer who says, disease is nothing but an attempt on the part of the body to rid itself of morbific matter. Now that's true of acute disease. So there was what I, I and I, and I saw this analogy of 
We are energy generating machines. We breathe, we eat, we produce energy or heat for life and running the process of the body that creates waste that has to be eliminated from the body. When the waste backlogs, um, it, it creates a stagnation in the system that allows for the overgrowth of harmful microbes. And then the body decides to get rid of this. It, it, it goes through a, what I call, I call vicarious elimination. It flushes it out through whatever channels of elimination it's got at its disposal, whether it's through the skin or the kidneys or the colon or the lungs, it's got to flush it out. And if you assist the body in flushing out the backlog of irritants and waste, generally speaking, the illness goes away really, really fast because the breathing ground for the microbes is gone because the microbes don't live in healthy tissue. They live in tissue that's weakened and stagnant and full of, of debris and mor morbid matter. And I've proven that to myself over and over again. Like when I was been really living uh, very cleanly and, and not eating a bunch of junk food and eating very healthy and maintaining a really good attitude, I've had my entire family get sick and I've nursed them all back to health and haven't gotten sick. You, you, you don't just catch illnesses, okay? Now, later, later, as I, I got more into this, I started understanding this wasn't just applying to acute disease, it was applying to co uh, chronic illness. And I began to see chronic illness as compensating mechanisms, um, as basically the body trying to cope with an ongoing lack of nutrients or presence of toxins or presence of some kind of mental or emotional stress that wasn't being dealt with. And the body was then doing its best to try to compensate or, or cope with this. So in other words, the disease is not a, a problem. The disease is a something the body's trying to do to deal with a problem. Same idea, but in this case, it's not trying to flush out a toxin. It's trying to compensate for a lack of something by, by making something else happen. So what, what I'm concerned about a lot with the way a lot of people think about using herbs and supplements is they think about them in terms of this whole idea of treating the disease, treating the compensating mechanism. In other words, how do I fix the compensating mechanism? And if you're switching to alternative remedies using herbs or vitamins or minerals or other things, and you're still thinking in terms of getting rid of symptoms, that's not going to result in, in better health because you're attacking the compensating mechanisms the body is trying to do to deal with what's really going on. Um, because whenever you're using medications, even if it's natural medications, even if it's natural medications to relieve symptoms, the end result will be an overall decline in health and energy. It will not be an improvement of health because you're because you're 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 thinking in terms of symptomatic relief not in terms of trying to understand what the body is lacking and what it needs or what you're exposing it to that's harming it so i'm going to give you just a couple of very very good practical examples of what i'm talking about let's start off with cholesterol okay there is a multi billion dollar industry selling statin drugs to lower cholesterol because cholesterol is this horrible, evil villain that sticks to your arteries and gives you heart disease and causes these horrific problems. No, 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 no. Um, cholesterol is the boat that transports fatty acids through your bloodstream to and from the cells of your body, from your liver to and from the cells of your body. Your liver makes low density lipoproteins, that's boats loaded with fatty acids to take out to your tissues. And then from your tissues come back high density lipoproteins, basically with fatty acids coming back from the tissues and also fat soluble toxins that the tissues have released that are being carried back to the liver to, to be eliminated. So LDL is not bad cholesterol and HDL is not good cholesterol. Cholesterol is cholesterol, and the body makes it because it needs it, because cholesterol is not only used as a transport mechanism, it's found in every cell membrane, it's the building block of all of your adrenal and 
uh, most of your adrenal and all of your reproductive hormones. Cholesterol is what's used to make testosterone, estrogen, uh, cortisol, aldosterone, pregnenolone, DHEA, and so forth. Cholesterol is also used to make bile so you can digest fats and absorb fat-soluble vitamins. Cholesterol is good. There's nothing wrong with cholesterol. So why does cholesterol get high? Okay, because the observation was is that countries that had higher levels of cholesterol tended to have higher levels of heart disease. And the answer is really simple, all right? Cholesterol binds environmental toxins to help protect your body against them to keep from harming. So in industrialized countries, which also have, have, happen to have more heart disease, you have higher levels of cholesterol because you have higher levels of environmental toxins and the um, liver is making more cholesterol to help bind those toxins and bring them back to the liver for elimination. That's, what, that's one primary reason why the cholesterol goes up. The cholesterol also goes up if your thyroid's low. Um, because you have a hard time burning fatty acids, so your body can't utilize the fatty acids that you have. Uh, and there's a couple of other reasons why cholesterol might go up. But none of them are because their body's doing something wrong. Your body, you, you're, the fundamental idea I'm trying to get across to you is your body is intelligent. I, I, of course, you know, I'm going to reveal my prejudice in this, but, but I'm also talking from all these, you know, 35 plus years of experience in applying this model, actually 38 years now, because it was 38 years ago, I figured this out and started working on this, this, on thinking about disease from this standpoint. Okay. But, but if you, <laughs> it, I believe that the body was divinely created, that there was a creator and he knew what he was doing when he made this body and he made it self-replicating, self-repairing. Uh, the whole body is formed from one one single cell. So in every cell of your body is the code that for forming the entire body, which means everything, it, all the instructions are present in the body to actually create the body. Now, so all the instructions must be present there to heal the body too, right? If the body knew how, if if that single cell contained all the information to create a body, it also then the cells also contain all the information to repair the body. They just have to have the right materials and you have to take away the things that are constantly damaging and irritating the body. That, that's basically it. That's my belief. So what I've come to understand is the body is not stupid. It doesn't elevate your cholesterol because it's stupid and it, and it doesn't know what it's doing. It knows exactly what it's doing. It's elevating cholesterol for a reason. So the answer for modern medicine is, okay, the cholesterol's up. Uh, We'll give you a drug that blocks the pathway that produces cholesterol, which also happens to be the pathway that produces a very critical nutritive substance called CoQ10, which reduces cardiovascular inflammation is used in the Krebs cycle for the creation of energy. And, and so the, the net effect is that heart disease risk doesn't change much at all because the real thing that causes cardiovascular disease is that you have something in the body that's causing damage to the artery linings. And the damaged or inflamed tissue causes a weakness in the artery wall. And cholesterol and calcium and certain other things in your blood come along and put a Band-Aid on that to protect that artery from blowing out because of the inflammation and weakness. So even arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, is a intelligent compensating mechanism of the body to try to save your life, okay? And you think it's something bad. Well, it, it's, it's bad in that your body is obviously so weak that it has to have these compensating mechanisms to try to keep it alive, but the compensating mechanisms aren't the problem. The cholesterol is not the problem. The patches in your arteries are not the problem. The problem is you don't have enough antioxidant nutrients to, to uh, help keep your arteries from becoming inflamed and irritated, as well as you may be taking in toxic substances um, that are causing that inflammation and irritation to arteries. Okay, you, The solution is not to take away the Band-Aid or to take away the, the material that's used to make the Band-Aid. The solution is to stop doing things that are irritating your arteries and start giving your body the nutrition it needs 
to repair them. That's the solution. It's all, that's, that's always the solution. Let's talk about high blood pressure. Okay. So every cell of your body needs blood, needs a, needs a flow of blood, bringing oxygen, nutrients, and everything to the tissues. So when things come along that interfere with the flow of blood in your extremities, which can be inflammation in your arteries leading to arterial sclerosis, or it could be a lot of stress that's constricting your blood vessels, making them tense, or there's a lack of nutrients like magnesium or L-arginine or other things, vitamin C, that keep the endothelial lining of your arteries healthy, which produce, the endothelial lining produces a substance called nitric oxide that dilates the blood vessels, let more blood flow out. Okay, so your cells out in the periphery of your body start complaining. We're not getting enough blood supply. We're not getting enough oxygen. We're not getting enough nutrients. And the brain goes, okay, I'll raise the blood pressure to force more blood out into those tissues so they can get the oxygen and nutrients and things they need. Because obviously there's some kind of obstruction in the cardiovascular system. So I've got to raise the pressure to get the blood to the tissues where it's needed. So you come along and your doctor says, oh, you got high blood pressure, horrible thing, okay, blah, blah, blah. We need to bring it down. So he gives you a drug that blocks what the brain is trying to do to elevate the blood pressure to get oxygen to your tissue, which means your, ox your tissues get less oxygen and nutrients. And then they complain to the brain more and the brain tries harder to raise the blood pressure and you're into the same kind of fight that you get with caffeine. This is, as, as I've gone through and learned all this, this is exactly what I understand what we're doing. It's, it's insane, okay? You gotta figure out why. Uh, is the person under a lot of stress? Uh, are they getting you know, inflammation and therefore arteriosclerosis in their arteries? Do, you know, what, what nutrients are they lacking? Do they need more magnesium? Uh, do they need more water? What, what is their body lacking that it needs? But of course, the reason why they got in that state is because for years and years, they've just been ignoring what their body's trying to tell them. And they're uh, living an unhealthy life not getting the nutrients they need, not getting the rest they need, not taking care of their body, thinking their body's just doing all this stuff to punish them. And they need some magic pill to make the punishment from the body go away because the body doesn't know what it's doing. The body knows exactly what it's doing. The body is intelligent. It does things for a reason. And if you just simply counteract what the body's trying to do without trying to figure out why it's trying to do it, you're just making everything worse. Oh yeah, sure. You'll relieve the symptom, but it doesn't, doesn't restore you back to health. Let's take just one more depression. Depression is also a symptom. Actually, the, the body creates depression for a variety of reasons. One of them is that a bad thing happens and you need to kind of rest and take it easy and recover. So the body makes it so you're not motivated to go out and struggle and work and everything so that you have time to grieve and go through what you need to go through. Which of course, if you don't, if you yeah, keep pushing yourself and you take something to try to make the depression go away and ignore the fact that your body's saying, hey, you need to take a break or whatever, then you never deal with the problem. You never deal with the grief. You never deal with the loss. You never deal with it because, because you're too busy. And then you... <laughs> Uh, maybe you get compounded uh, experiences like that that start pushing you more and more till the grief, co the, the, the depression comes on so hard that you can't ignore it anymore. Depression can also be purely physical. You, maybe your thyroid's low or your gut is, is um, really unhealthy from all of the junk food and crap you're eating and the lack of good healthy intestinal bacteria in your gut or or a, a recent study shows your brain is inflamed, okay? That depression can come because your brain gets inflamed. And inflammation comes because there's tissue damage, because you're getting toxins into your body, you're eating crappy food, or you're you know, taking alcohol or drugs or all kinds of things that are damaging and inflaming your body and inflaming your brain. So the depression comes in because it's trying to get you to stop. It's trying to make you back off. Wait a minute, think about what you're doing. Some years ago, I started to feel depressed. And because I recognized depression is a good thing, not a bad thing, 
It's my body trying to communicate to me that there's something I need to look at. I took a week off work and I did some meditation and I figured out what was bothering me and I fixed it and the depression went away. So the whole, the whole thing we're doing is we're dis, we're disempowering people to look at what's going on inside of them. I can't tell you how many times I've asked people, you know, well, let's just take with, with kids, all right? People have called me with problems with their children and they say, well, the doctor says this and blah, 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 but it doesn't seem to work. And, and I say, well, what do you think? And the parent says, well, I think this is the problem with the kid. And I look at it and go, sounds perfectly reasonable to me based on what I know. Why don't you try, try, try following your instinct as a parent and take care of that? And you know what? They do, and the kid gets well. And that has happened almost every time. In fact, every time I can think that I've done that, it's worked. Maybe there are times when, when parent, parental instincts would be bad, but I usually am encouraging them to follow their instincts. The same thing with you. You're, you've been disempowered not to trust yourself, not to listen to your body, not to believe in your own ability to look inside, figure out what's wrong, and do something. You got to have somebody out there tell you what to do, and you got to work out you with your brain because you can't listen to your body, you can't listen to your heart, you can't listen to yourself, and figure this out. Most of my health problems have been solved by me praying, meditating, getting answers, and going out and doing something. Sometimes the answer has been an impression to go see somebody who gave me the information I needed or to find a book or whatever. And sometimes it's just been direct. Just understanding you're not drinking enough water, you're not getting enough sleep, you're not doing whatever. And then I go ahead and I change that and I get better. I, my message is, is one that I want to empower people. I don't want to disempower people. I don't want people looking at me as the guru who's going to tell them what is wrong with them because the best indication of what's wrong with them is their own body talking to them i'm the coach who's trying to get figure out what their body's trying to say and help them to actually get the confidence to go out and do it this all boils down to a very very simple statement that samuel thompson said remove the cause and the effect will cease Symptoms are an effect. They are not a cause. The cause always lies in you're not giving the body something it needs, you're doing something that's harming the body, or you have unresolved mental and emotional stress that you need to take a look inside and figure out what you need to do to change your life from where it's at, which, which has to do with the emotional component of healing, which I have, which I uh, is a big part of this. Uh, you know, a big part of it is detoxification. A big part of it is nutrition. The other big part of it is your mental and emotional attitude. If if you change the cause, if you fix the cause, if you're dehydrated and you drink water, all the symptoms of dehydration go away. If you're deficient in magnesium and you take magnesium, all the deficient, all the symptoms of magnesium deficiency go away. If you're deficient in vitamin D3 and you take vitamin D3, all the symptoms of vitamin D3 deficiency go away. The trick is learning to get in touch with your own inner healer and, and follow that. I can't tell you how, okay, but I, I'm gonna just, this wasn't a thought I had planned on talking about, but I just wanna, wanna say this because it's really important. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and they're taking a bunch of nutritional supplements. And they'll, I'll tell them, okay, why are you taking this one? Why are you taking that one? Blah, blah. And they'll say, okay, well, I'm taking this one because I heard it was good for me. And I say, so how long have you been taking it? Two months. Have you noticed any difference in your health? No. Then why are you still taking it? Understand? <laughs> why are you taking it? If, if, if I get, you know, if I'm trying something, if I, I, if I have a health problem and I'm trying something that I think might be beneficial, and I don't see an improvement in a week or two, I quit taking it. It's not working. You, you have to trust yourself. You have to start learning to trust yourself. You have to learn to observe, pay attention, not be just so caught up in what everybody else says is good for you, but to actually start to trust your own instincts and learn how to, to, to get in touch with things. 
the are the problems incurable diseases or are they incurable people? You know that lady that I mentioned earlier who was severely dehydrated. She was an incurable person because she'd rather suffer than drink water. That's a strange thing to me, you know. That there are people who would rather suffer than drink water. It's a strange thing to me that there are people who would rather suffer than get sleep or would rather suffer than eat a better diet and give up their junk food. It's a strange thing to me. I don't understand it. I like feeling good. I like being healthy. I, I, I don't like feeling crappy. And the reason I, I, I've quit doing a lot of things that are bad for me is because I realize it makes me feel crappy and I don't want to do it. When I gave up refined sugar, and I, and I have to say refined sugar keeps slipping its way back into my diet, but I keep pushing it out again. But when I really gave it up and actually stayed away from it completely, I actually had this like thing where the, the this brain fog cleared away and I felt better than I'd ever felt in my whole life, which made it easy to avoid sugar because I liked feeling good. I like feeling good. That's why I do what I do. I pay attention to my body. Okay? Now, if you're interested in learning more along this line, there's a lot of resources you can go to. I'm going to open a question and answer period here in just a moment. But I, I have all of this put together in a very good course, The Fundamentals of Natural Healing, which I'm teaching this year. There are four modules. The first one is almost completed. The, the last session is this Thursday. The second one begins in a couple of weeks. The links are on the, the handouts here, and I did upload the handouts to the webinar, so you download them from the webinar, but I will also send out a link to the handouts for, for everybody who registered for the webinar so you can get them. You can click on these links. These courses are all up at treelight.com, which is down at the bottom, treelight.com, um, and you can register for them. The Complete Fundamentals of Natural Healing course, which is 32 lessons. Uh, that are all dealing with teaching you how to work on the cause instead of treat the effect is um, only $250. Uh, each module is $75. Um, so if you don't want to take the whole thing, you can take one module. We're going to talk about the next one is healing acute disease. I'm going to talk about how to get rid of colds, sore throats, flu, earaches, um, rashes, all that stuff really rapidly by helping the body do what it's trying to do, which is what I talked about earlier tonight. Um, also, if you're interested in the mental and emotional part of this, um, I have doing a 2000, uh, an online emotional healing course. It's completely free. Um, module one, Spiritual Foundations of Emotional Healing. I just did the um, sixth lesson out of the first eight last night. They're all posted on YouTube for free. You can also register for the live webinars. Um, module two will begin in uh, March. And if you register for module one, you can, um, you'll get an email telling you how to, how to hook up with module two, but they're all free. You don't have to pay anything. I'm, I'm very anxious to get the information out about, about how to, to work with this. If you want more, more information, you can visit my website, stephenhorn.com. I do a member program, one webinar each month on physical healing, the other one on mind, body, spirit, social healing. Um, it's only $20 a month. Our, our products are at treelight.com. And you can also watch lots of free videos, webinars, and so forth that I've recorded in the past to, to get this kind of training on our YouTube channel, Herbal Education. So um, please take advantage of some of these. If what I'm saying makes sense to you, then uh, I just there's a lot more information that gives you a lot more detail about how to heal from this standpoint. Now we're time for the question and answer period. Um, someone actually made a comment that coffee makes uh, them sleepy, which uh, by the way, does happen to some people because, and this by the way, um, I don't know exactly why that's the case, except for the fact that you might be a parasympathetic, have a parasympathetic dominant nervous system, in which case the coffee helps balance out your nervous system. But the fact is this brings up the point that whatever we talk about is generalities. The specific application is you paying attention to how things make you feel, letting your body tell you what it needs. I can talk in generalities, but I can't talk in specifics. Your body is different than mine. 
your genetic makeup is different than mine. Your constitution is different than mine. You can't learn how to balance your own body if you don't pay attention to your own body and trust your own body and your own instincts. If you put the, the biggest problem we have, okay, is we've been taught to disregard ourselves and put our confidence in some expert who knows better what's good for us than we do. So I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with someone and they're taking a drug and it's giving them horrific side effects and they won't consider giving it up because their doctor says they'll die if they don't have it. In other words, they trust their doctor more than they trust themselves and their own experience of what that's doing to them. I would never take anything that was making me feel worse. That's ridiculous. Okay? Or people do the same thing with, with nutritionists and herbalists and everything else. They give away their power and they think this other person is someone who they should listen to without ever questioning it. You go to other people for advice to, to give you counseling, but ultimately you have to experiment and figure out what works for you and what works for your body. That's, that's the, the thing that I think most people just fail to grasp. And it is, and it is my big mission in life is to empower people. I don't want people looking to me as the guru to solve their problems. I want people looking to me for ideas that guide them and nudge them to help them kind of figure out how to solve their own problems. I'm interested in empowering people, not disempowering people. And I think most things in our society are all designed to disempower you so that you have to go to the expert, to the guru, to the whatever, and pay them to fix you. I don't, believe in that model. I believe that we have the power, especially with help of God, to get answers to whatever problems are facing us. And my, my ho hope for you tonight is that this has inspired you to start paying attention to your body, to start paying attention to what your body is trying to tell you, to start understanding that the symptoms you experience are not your body hating you and being mean to you. They're your body trying to cope with what you're doing and trying to communicate to you what it needs and what will fix it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being part of this. Please, if you enjoyed this message, this video will be up on YouTube. I will send you an email to the link. Please share it with as many people as possible because I really want to help get this message out to as many people as we can. Good night.